Sure, no problem. Uh, finance and personnel, it's 646-749-3128. Originally, yeah. The more I thought about it, my cell phone doesn't work so good at home. And I figured you guys wanted me to be in 4K clarity. <laughs> 5K? Well, it's coming, I heard. <laughs> Which one? The one my, my neighbor? He hasn't said that. I can... He has no reason. Are you interested in me? <laughs> Could land in the pool. <laughs> Mary Lynn's calling in right now, Eric. Inform me. Hi, this um, I sounds like we got a lot of people calling in, which is great. I am going to um, just do our roll call first. Um, would everyone who's on the phone please say hello? Okay. Marilyn, you might want to just call off. Do you have a list of who um, should be calling in? I don't. So I will just take a stab at it. Jim Boren? I uh, hear. All right. And Todd, I understand you're in council chambers. Yes, I am. Uh, Marcus Cavallio? About Trey Mitchell. I'm here. Trey, is that you? It is. I'm here. Okay. And did I hear Marcus? No, Marcus. No, not yet. All right. Um, we have a quorum for our meeting. Um, why don't we um, identify the other folks uh, other than Todd who are in the council chambers? We're lining up. Uh, Daryl Hoffland, city administrator. Chad Pelishek, planning okay. director. Mayor Vandersteen. Okay. Sorry, Vicky. I didn't hear that. It was Mike Vandersteen. Mike? Okay. Vicki Schneider. Okay. Melissa Ness. All right. Eric Bushman and Marty Halverson. All right. And I understand there are a couple of other IT folks in the room? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Um, with that, uh, why don't we get started? Um, if you'll join me in your own way, wherever you are uh, in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which, which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good. Um, so uh, just a couple of uh, ground rules that have worked uh, well so far. If you are not speaking, if you would put your microphone or your phone or whatever you have on mute, uh, that is helpful. Um, I'm going to continue on, on speaker. Um, if that becomes difficult for folks or if anyone else on a speaker phone has trouble, we'll probably need to change that out. Um, 
if you wish to be recognized, um, just give a shout out to me uh, and I will recognize you. Um, you'll have to identify yourself and then um, understand that there are uh, lapses in time. So we're going to, uh, this will be particularly hard for me, but we're going to give everybody a chance just to, for that little transfer of time before you start to speak, if that's okay with everyone. All right. Uh, let's practice on 2.1, which is approval of the minutes of our March 9th meeting. Do I have a motion to approve? To that is there a second? Second. All right. Now we need to all right. make sure you're, if you can, make sure your microphones are on mute unless you're speaking. Um, I heard Todd Wolf um, uh, move to approve the minutes. I didn't get who seconded that. Uh, that was Trey. Great. All right. So it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Ooh. Chair votes aye. And again, we're getting some feedback, so please, uh, if you can make sure that your microphone is on mute if you're not speaking. All right, we are going to go into uh, 3.1. Uh, which is a resolution to um, uh, from the Board of Water Commissioners to approve, seeking approval of a taxable $3.1 million water revenue bond anticipation note to fund engineering costs ahead of the project construction. And that was uh, held from March 9th. Who wishes to speak on this to get started? Mary Lynn, I believe uh, this, this is Marty. From the water utility. Mary Lynn is our, say that again, Joe. Joe, do you yeah, want to true blood from the water utility? And Joe, are you on the phone? I am. Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, Jerry, uh, Jerry Van de Creek. Take... Sorry, Jerry Van de Creek, also from the water utilities on the line. Okay. All right. Anybody else from the water utility? All right. Very good. Why don't you go ahead, Joe, and, and walk us through what you're looking for? Well, just briefly, we're at the introduction of a very large capital investment project. Uh, we're referring to it as a raw water improvement project. And it involves putting a new, very large intake pipeline about a mile out into Lake Michigan. And then some structure on the shoreline, pumping stations, and, and other equipment involved with that. Um, <clears throat> currently, all the water. Uh, in the city comes through one of two intake pipelines. One of those dates to 1909, and the other dates to 1959. And after a lot of review and planning and such, uh, we uh, are convinced that the time is now to begin the next era of intake pipelines for the utility to serve uh, for another 100 years. These do have a very long lifetime. So what's before the committee tonight and what the Board of Water Commissioners has seen as well, and uh, Carol Worth is, is here also by phone to describe in more detail is the initial uh, funding uh, device for the project. Because it's a very large capital project, there are uh, very large engineering costs, and we're just beginning in preliminary engineering. So Ms. Worth has... Uh, uh, aided us in identifying a short-term financing tool for the engineering cost, and, and that is the issue uh, before the committee tonight. Um, okay, uh, uh, Carol, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. Okay, and uh, why don't you walk us through uh, as briefly as you can, but in as much detail as you need to, the um, bond anticipation note. I think that's what Joe was re referring to. That is correct. And uh, I do have a handout that was distributed for uh, this meeting that does contain some of the details. Um, and I know that's further on down in your agenda. 
Uh, so if you'd like, I can just briefly describe it here and then we can uh, uh, go through the report when we get to that point on your agenda, if that's okay with you. Well, uh, if, if that's the case, then why don't we um, just wait um, why don't we just wait um, until we get to that point on the agenda unless if, if anyone feels that there's anything else that we need to uh, to take on right at this point? Motion to approve 3.1. Sorry, I have. Okay. Is there, and that was Todd? Yes. All right. Is there a second? Uh, second, Jim Boren. Okay. Is there any uh, further discussion? All right. With the understanding that we'll be going into this in more detail uh, as we go down the agenda, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Very good. So, Carol, if you just stay on the line, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, take it from there. Uh, okay. Section, uh, uh, item 3.2 is uh, the operational and organizational assessment report uh, from February 7th with regard to the City of Sheboygan's Finance and Human Resources Department, um, which was prepared by Clifton Larson Allen. Um, as you'll remember, this came to us um, in February, and it is our intent to continue discussion on this. Mary Lynn? Into the new year, into the new council year. Mary Lynn? With that in mind, is there a motion? Yes? Mary Lynn, I would like to make a motion to move this to Finance and Personnel, new committee. Very good, is there a second? Second, Warren. All right, is there any discussion then on um, uh, moving this to the new council year? Mary Lynn? Just add one, this is, this well, is ahead, Warren, I have, I have one question. Uh, I guess this would be for Marty. Uh, Marty, how long into the new year, the new council year, would we expect uh, a report from you on your action plan for this document? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, we uh, are currently in the process of taking the 30-page uh, document and working it down into about a three-page summary that each of the uh, finance department and human resources uh, department staff, as well as some information technology staff, are taking the categories and putting them into priority groups. Um, our time frame prior to the COVID-19 was roughly the beginning of April. I believe it's going to take probably till the end of April with some of our priorities in different areas. Uh, we currently are trying to work with the staff in various locations, which adds a little bit of a challenge. Um, so I would expect that by the first uh, finance and committee meeting in May, we should be able to provide uh, the uh, summarized document uh, with priority groupings to discuss. I just had, I have one question, Marty, and that is, uh, is there any low hanging fruit that you can kind of uh, take care of from that report? Uh, one concern I had was just the cash handling at the, uh, at the cashier's desk. I would imagine that would be something with procedure that you could take care of pretty quickly or have you already taken care of those? There's, yeah, Jim, there's several <laughs> items that have already been um, either finalized or are in process of, of adjusting and adapting and making changes. So there are some low hanging fruit in each of the different categories that we're able to address. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Mary Lynn, this is Todd. Yes. I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, just to kind of expand, I wanted to expand on uh, Jim and Marty's uh, points. We know that this uh, report um, for finance and for, human, uh, for HR is very important. And we know that during the COVID-19 has kind of changed some direction and, and what's going on. We want to make sure that we take the report and we vet it very closely and, and concisely working with the management and the, and the teams 
and making sure that we, we develop a, a good plan for moving forward um, to make this a better, uh, a better environment and a better process. That's all. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, all I would, uh, just in, in terms of uh, Marty's plan, which I think is a sound one, um, we really need, uh, in addition to prioritizing and, 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 and going through it carefully, I think we really need a really strong plan to address many of the concerns that were brought up. And so I think that as well what, what uh, both finance and human resources are working on and what we hope to kind of get to uh, in early May. So uh, with that in mind uh, and no further discussion, all in favor of the motion, please state aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Chair votes aye, and the motion passes. Thank you. 3.3 is the petition and notice of the tax liens uh, subject to tax foreclosure uh, for 2014, 15, and 16. Um, Chuck, are you in the room? Chuck's not with us. Um, I what? assume that this is. Um, Chuck was online. Docket here. I'm sorry. Chuck was online, unless we lost him. Oh, and I did. Yeah, okay. He, oh, he was. He. He was. Okay. I Chuck. Don't Chuck's not that, there. But it, I think this is probably. Uh, if, Someone else has any information. Um, <clears throat> this is a motion to uh, uh, to accept and file. Daryl, do you uh, or Marty have any other ideas about what we should be doing with this? Chad's actually coming to the microphone. Okay. Thanks. So this is Chad Pelashek, and a lot of these, we were served this document, a lot of these are um, city development loans that we have on properties that we've used uh, money, federal money, to enhance people's uh, selected properties. Um, a number of the other ones are uh, properties that we have judgments and liens against, primarily in building code violations and some civil matters. Um, some of these are good for the community, some of these aren't so good for the community, but this is a general course of action that we always get a notification from the county as to when they're going to foreclose, and then uh, we take appropriate steps on our, ends to, our end to uh, deem those loans uncollectible and the uh, city attorney's office files whatever is needed. So your motion of accepting and file, this is more of a public record document just to notify you guys of the properties that they're going to foreclose on. Motion to file. Thank you. Did I, did I hear a motion to file? Yes, from Todd. From Todd. And is there a second? Second from Trey. Okay. Yeah, okay. I would just say that as you look through this kind of long document, um, the only sad thing for the city is that uh, this. Um, this action essentially forecloses all of the other liens that are on the property. Um, should there be leftover money, I believe the county distributes it um, to uh, lien holders, uh, but typically the city doesn't get a great deal out of this, but it's something that has to be done. Uh, if there is no other discussion, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Chair goes side, motion passes. All right. And Mary, Mary Lynn, uh, Chuck Adams here, just noting that uh, I got cut off and I'm back on the call. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> you missed your moment in the sun, so, you know, what can I say? Um, you were probably happy to be cut off. No, just kidding. Um, all right, 3.4 and um, 3.5 essentially are, well, they're two different matters. Uh, let's go to 3.4, which is 
providing for the sale of $3.1 million in uh, taxable water utility revenue bond anticipation note. Um, and Carol, are you still on the line? Yes, I am. Um, I assume you'll speak to both 3.4 and 3.5? That is correct. Okay. Um, well, I shouldn't, I, I just assumed on 3.5, but w let's go with 3.4. Um, away you go. Okay. I'm going to refer to um, a report that I have uh, provided for the meeting. And it actually will be covering uh, both of those resolutions in the report. And they are prepared in a very similar format. This is the process of starting to uh, uh, borrow money for 2020. And the resolution is called the set sale resolution. It basically starts by identifying the dollar amount and the purpose in the first whereas in each resolution. So you will see for the water utility, we have 3.1 million and the statutory purpose language is described as cost of improvements, additions, extensions to the water utility and then specifically mentions the engineering and design costs of the intake project. The city's CIP resolution does mention the 4,985 and the purposes, which are the city 2020 capital improvement plan purposes, then goes through a list of the items that we are borrowing for in statutory terms. So that's where you have the building repairs, renovations, streets and sidewalk repair and improvements, park improvements and upgrades, stormwater, and acquisition of vehicles and other equipment. We also are financing some uh, projects for uh, the city's tax increment district. The resolutions also in section two, uh, the, I, I should say the second whereas of each resolution talks about the type of issue that we are going forward with. So you will see in the water resolution, it talks about this issuance being a revenue bond anticipation note. And again, this is an interim financing vehicle. It is a short term vehicle. It's still under the revenue bond statute. It is not general obligation debt of the city. The city's CIP borrowing is listed as a general obligation promissory note. And promissory notes is uh, what the city has uh, for the most part traditionally used for its capital improvement borrowing. And that means that we are restricted to a repayment period of, of 10 years or less. And this is uh, a, a general obligation supported by tax levy, uh, can be offset by other revenues, but the security behind that is, is tax levy. The resolution both in section one identifies again the dollar amount and the title of the issue. Uh, and then in section two says that we're going to public sale. And section three of the resolution basically say that uh, we are directing us, uh, our firm to proceed with the notice of sale and the preparation of the official statement that's required in order to access the bond market. Um, as a public sale, the council takes, I'm sorry, the, um, we will receive bids on behalf of the city on a certain date and time, and uh, we come back to the council uh, for approval uh, of those results. And we'll talk about that process in a, in a little bit. The uh, issue details uh, that we're referring to in the second part of my report on page one um, does say that both the city and the water utility uh, begin the process with, first of all, identifying and approving the dollar amounts for the project. We review the IRS, the federal law regulations with regard to spend down, how quickly the city and the utility are required to spend tax exempt money. 
and we also reviewed structuring options and the debt for each of these is structured to coincide with the anticipated revenue stream for each purpose. And we will and are in the process of preparing an, an official statement for the city's CIP issue and an official statement for the water utilities revenue ban. We distribute those into the marketplace and we also apply for a Moody's bond rating. The process for the bond rating is going to be uh, one application for the city's long-term rating for the notes, and your long-term general obligation rating is a AA2. And we are also going to apply for the Moody's short-term rating, and that's called a MIG rating, and it stands for Moody's Investment Grade for the Water Utility Revenue Band. The water utility does have a long-term Moody's AA2 rating. When you issue this type of a security, this structure for an interim financing vehicle, Moody's will assign um, the short-term uh, MIG rating. The administration of both the city and the utility, and as well as myself, are going to participate in the conference call scheduled on April 21st. Moving to the second page of the report, uh, now we're getting into the, the details. Uh, we have the 4,985 notes, and they are issued for four purposes. We have dollar amounts identified at the top, 3,635 for the city CIP, and we have three other dollar amounts for various TID projects. All of these projects have been reviewed by Bond Council and are eligible for tax exempt financing and will be secured by the levy of taxes with the expectation that there will be increment from the respective TIF districts to offset that levy. And also there will be dollars uh, that will come in from the bidding on the issue from the uh, underwriters uh, that will also uh, offset that debt service. In addition, we are expecting uh, to do some refinancing later in 2020 of some 2007 bonds that are outstanding at, at very, rather high interest rates and could pose a, uh, quite a savings opportunity for, for the city. But we can't do it at this time uh, because that is subject to certain rules for refunding. That means we have to do it within 90 days of, of the first call date, which is later in the year. All of the money for the city's CIP, because it is tax exempt, must be under federal law be spent in 24 months. Because they are general obligation notes under state law, we have to repay them or have a structure here to repay them within 10 years or less. So these notes are structured out with a principal payment due on December 1st, and that means December 1st of 2029 is the last date that we can um, have a principal maturity. We will also have a prepayment feature beginning in the year 2027. So the, the structure that you see there for 4985 is for all three purposes. We prepared this information back on March 11th, and so I wanted you to see um, how we began the process with uh, the structuring. And you'll see the coupons are all 2%, but you will see that there is a TIC at the bottom, which is called the true interest cost of a 1.59 and the reason for that is because with this pricing the anticipated pricing it was expected that the city would receive over hundred and thirty thousand dollars of premium from investors and when you receive the premium that offsets that two percent coupon and that's how you get it down to the 159 so there you'll see then the interest generated, you'll see the total. At the bottom is the pricing schedule. What is significant about this pricing schedule is to track the market, you track the yield column. You'll see there that the yield for the first maturity is a 0 0.90 and it gradually walks up to the 2029 year of a 1.45. With all the coupons at 2% means that these are all purchased as premium bonds, which is very standard for a bank qualified tax exempt issue. That difference between those two columns is a generating premium, and that is reflected in the dollar price column to the far right side of the page. And if you look at the total, you'll see 
that totals five million one ninety six. The difference between the four million ninety five and that number is the premium, which is over two hundred and eleven thousand dollars. The underwriter keeps some of that to pay his expenses as well as all other expenses of our fee, bond council, and rating. And then whatever he does not use for those purposes comes back to the city. And the only thing you can do with that premium is a use it to offset debt service payments. But that does bring the true interest cost down to that 1.59, which is the very last number on page two. Moving to page three, we go through the exercise for the 3 million one of water revenue bands in the same way. Now, what's different about the revenue bands is that this is an interim financing structure. And the reason it's interim is because it is being used to provide for the engineering costs, which are very sizable right now. Typically, when you start a project and you have engineering costs, sometimes front that money until you actually get closer to the construction date. With this $3 million, of course, that would create quite an um, impact on the utilities cash flow. So what we're doing is creating an interim financing vehicle until the time that the construction of the project is anticipated to begin, which matching the timetable for the anticipated vehicle to use for the long-term revenue bonds. And right now, the, the utility is preparing a application for a state of Wisconsin safe drinking water loan program that would provide 30-year um, financing for the project. The loan program right now provides 20-year loans. However, the loan program is also in the process of of applying or, or filling out whatever documentation is necessary in order to um, be allowed to have 30-year loans for the Safe Drinking Water Program. And that is not anticipated to be a problem, but if we're just in the process of that um, taking place right now. Now, worst case scenario, if that program is not available, the utilities uh, high quality bond rating does allow you to have access to the municipal bond market Either way, they would become revenue bonds. And either way, in, including this ban, they are obligations of the water utility paid from the water utility revenues generated through the rates that are, are uh, applied for and approved through the uh, Public Service Commission. There is no tax levy support pledged to their payment. Uh, these bond anticipation notes even though we have them coming due all at one time. All the principal is scheduled to come due on May 1st of 2024. Although we put a prepayment feature beginning on November 1st of 2021. We do that in, to, to maintain the flexibility for the utility to convert the principal payment to long-term financing through the state safe drinking water loan program when that program is available to do so and to take advantage of any, any principal forgiveness or interest subsidy available through that program. Uh, if for some reason the program is taking a little bit longer to, uh, to, to complete its uh, process of 30-year funding, uh, that's not a problem. That's the reason we put it out to the year 2024 to give flexibility with the beginning of the construction of the project, which is right now anticipated for June of 2022, um, or as I said, uh, access to the availability of funding through the loan program. So that's uh, the reason why this is a little bit different. Uh, it's an interim step, uh, but it provides a great deal of flexibility uh, to the utility to respond to uh, providing funding while it is needed in order to cash flow the engineering costs, but it is also designed to accommodate a timetable for um, the Safe Drinking Water Loans Program. Uh, that program would uh, be able to refinance the principal amount on these, on these revenue bands, uh, but in the meantime, the interest payments would definitely be coming from the revenues of the uh, water utility. Uh, the pricing summary is the 
interest rate and the yield are both one and a half percent on on at this time now these are structured as taxable they're not tax exempt like the city's cip notes and the reason for that is because of some of the unknowns with regard to the expenditure of the uh, costs related uh, for this engineering cost if we did a tax exempt the utility would definitely have to commit to spending that within the 24 months. If we do it as taxable, uh, there is no requirement as to how long you have to spend the funds. So uh, as we had discussed this with the commissioners, um, we felt that the commissioners uh, needed the uh, flexibility of uh, the expenditure period and uh, so we structured this as a taxable, and as a taxable, it is very common for the coupon and the yield to be the same, and they are actually bid at a discount. So it's a little bit different than uh, what you would experience with a tax-exempt structure. So they would simply discount the issue for the amount of their expenses, uh, which brings the true interest cost to the 1.63. Although built into this dollar amount, it is expected that any other expenses associated with the issuance would be uh, taken out of that $3.1 million. Okay. Um, any questions up to this point? Does anyone have questions for Carol? No, great job. Okay, then... I can continue on with the rest of the report, which is obviously on the same subject, but um, a little different information, um, and that is page four. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the market. I mean, we always do talk about the market, but, but we've gone through some, uh, as we keep using that word, unprecedented times during the month of March when we began this process and prepared this information. The market experienced um, a, quite a, a large swing from what was recorded at the beginning of the month as record lows to, uh, to the, almost the end of the month as record highs. Uh, there was what's called a 200 basis point sell-off. 200 basis points is 2%. So if you were looking at a yield that was 1% at the beginning of March, it was 3% within that same month. Then on March 27th, it started to turn around very, very quickly, where in, in two days, the market was capturing or recapturing about a half a percent a day, reversing that trend. Now, what happened during that time is a lot of um, institutional investors uh, like money markets, uh, municipal bond funds, uh, they were selling off their municipal bonds into the marketplace. And the underwriters were trying to absorb that sell-off. Well, what happened is there were more bonds being sold off than there were purchasers to accept that sell-off. So what happened is that created a liquidity problem in the market. And the underwriters certainly did not have funds or capital to go out and purchase issues, new money issues in the market. So it really brought the market to a screeching halt. So um, what happened is that the, um, the, the Fed took action in a couple of different ways that bottom line allows the federal government now, and actually in some cases requires the federal government to actually purchase municipal bonds. So it's another buyer in the market and that made uh, the market uh, quite happy and you started to see uh, these trends turn around and I mean it's only been a couple of days it seems like it's been uh, six months ago but it's uh, every day I mean we are monitoring markets so tightly um, throughout the morning and afternoon both to see what's going on but during that time, um, issuers all canceled their sales. I mean, there was no sales because there was no money for the um, uh, the, invest the underwriters to purchase the municipal bonds. Now, when I'm talking about that bond market, OK, 
Okay, that particular bond market is called the general market. The general market definitely applies to issues that are not bank qualified. And the city of Sheboygan has been in the market uh, frequently with non-bank qualified bonds. The notes are bank qualified. What that means is that banks are still in the market. Banks are still willing to buy bonds and has money to buy bonds. So that's a good thing. So this is a good year for us to be going to market with bank qualified. The taxable bond market is reacting somewhat very close to the bank qualified market in the sense that banks are interested in purchasing those. So we've been a little bit more resilient than the um, non-bank qualified market that, like I said, was just about shut down uh, when this happened. So we've been monitoring rates. Um, there have been a few issues coming back into the market very slowly uh, this week. And next week, there are a lot more issues on the calendar. So that's a good sign. Uh, what we've been seeing in the last couple of days is we've been seeing uh, two Wisconsin issues. I'd like to look at specifically Wisconsin because, of course, it's a, a, a very comparable result uh, because certain states have different tax advantages. And I can tell you that um, we've had some good results here with, uh, for example, the um, – uh, the village of Germantown sold, which is also a double A2 credit, uh, and they did 10 year notes, and their TIC came in at a 1.75, and they had eight bids. So you can see that there is definitely interest. And the village of Wanakee sold also on Monday. Both of these sold on Monday, and that was a double A2, uh, 9.6 million. That was 15 years, and they came in at a 1.79, also had eight bids. So that's pretty much all we've seen so far for um, sales from Wisconsin. There have been some sales for other states, but um, there has been some, you know, uh, interest in entering back into the market. So when I look at those rates now uh, from these last two issues, and I put those yields onto the Sheboygan uh, Geo Note. That 1.59 TIC that we've seen uh, could become like a 1.9, okay? Because that includes expenses and it includes an assumption of what the underwriter's cost is going to be, which we don't know yet. It could be low, lower than that, so it's a very conservative estimate. If it really was that, you know, 1.9, um, we would probably be about a hundred thousand dollars difference from that number at a 1.59. Now, if we would have been selling during that high point that, um, that the market really reached, then we would have experienced a cost of about 300000 more than what we are showing in this report. So you can see that um, I did attach a graph um, of a market indicator that is used by all underwriters. It's called a, a BVOL curve. Um, that's my last page. And you'll see uh, from the month of March what exactly happened to interest rates and where we're at as of April 3rd, which, of course, was last week, Friday. Now, since that time, every day has been coming in at anywhere from 10 to 15 basis points lower since Friday. So I know it's only a short-lived um, uh, trend, but... Uh, but at least we are seeing it going in, in the right direction for now. So with regard to the water revenue band, the high point, we would have been looking at about a two and a quarter percent. Uh, right now, again, there are not a ton of taxables to look at. I've looked at some from other states. It would look like we're somewhere between a 1.8 and a 2% interest rate as of right now. Okay, so, so that's the impact of markets and, um, and what we're seeing and what the trend is. So that takes me to the final topic on page four, which is the award resolution. Uh, the next action besides the set sale resolutions by the council is that you would adopt award resolutions on the day of sale. 
In those resolutions, you'll have two separate ones, one for the notes, one for the bands. They will lock in the final terms and interest rates. And you'll, you'll, you normally have your finance committee meeting where you receive that information, accept that information, and then we, we have those uh, adopted by the council um, <coughs> the night of the 4th. And then the funds would be scheduled for delivery on May 18th to both the utility and the city. Now, one thing that we are going to do in order to provide the um, uh, city with a little bit more flexibility uh, is we are going to have a different type of award resolution drafted that will allow the city, if we get to the end of the month of April, and it's looking like something disastrous has happened in the market and we don't want to sell on May 4th, because the city has a definite locked-in structure for its four million nine eighty-five, then we would um, reserve the right for the council to take action on the fourth on a resolution that really grants the authority to the city administrator to award the bonds on a future sale date. That it won't be tied to a council meeting date, but it'll be a future sale date when the market conditions are right. Um, however, if we get to the May, uh, close to that May 4th date and we see that things are going well and we're going to sell on May 4th, then we will be presenting you with the standard traditional award resolution for, for your approval. With regard to the uh, revenue ban, we are not going to have that type of resolution. We are going to use the traditional award resolution for the draft as well as the final. And the reason for that is because uh, we're dealing with an interim financing. It is one maturity. It has a great deal of flexibility with the call. So, um, and we're not, you know, we're not seeing anything at the moment that um, the taxable would be uh, impacted um, as the tax exempt or, or non-bank qualified, um, I should say bank qualified or non-bank qualified market could be. So uh, with that, I think I've uh, covered everything that I wanted to, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mary Lynn? Does anyone, anyone have questions for uh, Carol? Mary Lynn? Uh, Todd? Yep, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank Carol because she, she does such a great job looking for different uh, ways for us to save money and consolidate, especially right now with uh, the very interesting times that we're in. And I, I wanted to also thank her for explaining um, some of the reactions that she's seeing and like in the B-Valve and that B-Valve, because um, one of my questions was going to be, I know the government is very concerned where people are going to start to be more conservative right now, which will actually take and twist things into a negative way. And um, we definitely need to be able to give, um, you know, Daryl and the team the ability to make the decision to lock in as quickly as possible when they do see the best, um, the best opportunity out there. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you. She's answered like every question, some that I didn't even realize I had. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions for Carol? Uh, I had, this is Jim Boren. I had one. Uh, Carol, when we get to the cities, the cities borrowing, uh, and with the way the market is, what, what, what have we talked about? What our tolerance would be for? You were throwing around numbers of an additional two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand uh, dollars. <coughs> does it get to the point where? you know, we really have to take a look at delaying this borrowing as far as, you know, our payback and that type of thing? Yes, we do. Um, part of that parameters resolution that um, is actually the um, revised award resolution will ask us to state in there in order to give direction to the city administrator. It'll ask us to include things like what is the maximum interest rate that you would um, award the bonds to? What is the maximum purchase price that the underwriter can bid on the bonds? So we will definitely 
need to have that information. We will have that discussion, and we will then make that part of the resolution that the um, council will act on providing that direction to administration. Okay, that's, uh, that's very helpful, Carol. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other uh, questions for Carol? Um, if not, I think what we will do is go to uh, 3.4, and I would ask for a uh, resolution authorizing the city to issue sale of $3.1 million in taxable water utility revenue bond anticipation notes, series 2020B. Motion to recommend. Is there a second? Uh, more. Second. All right. We have a, a motion and second. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 All right. Any nays? Chair votes aye. Very good. We'll go on to. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place here. To um, resolution 187, uh, requesting, uh, asking for a motion to recommend that we authorize the city to issue sale of $4,985,000 in general obligation promissory notes, series 2028. Motion to recommend. Uh, second. All right, second from Trey. Um, is there any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Sorry, I didn't give you enough time to get in there. Um, uh, are there uh, any, uh, uh, any votes against? Sorry. Hearing none, uh, on the chair vote side. Hearing none, um, the resolution is passed. And I think, am I correct? Does this do it for Carol, or do we need to um, continue on with, to continue to have Joe, Jerry, and, and Carol on the line? I believe she's done. That's all that's on the agendas. If you, okay. If you folks want to ring off, fine. If you want to stay, that's perfectly fine as well. Thanks, thank Carol. Thank you, for, Jerry. Um, okay, uh, thank you. All, all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you much. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. Um, we will move on to 3.6, which is a resolution terminating uh, the city's uh, TID number 11, authorizing the finance director to distribute excess increment to overlying taxing districts. Artie, do you want to? Mary, Mary Lynn, this is Chad Pelishek. Or Chad, very good. So the uh, TIF district we're talking about today is TID 11, which encompasses primarily the area around the Washington Square uh, Mall where the Piggly Wiggly is on the south side of Sheboygan. Um, that district, I think, was created back in 1998 as a redevelopment of an old conical fill site that was a contaminated property. Um, we've expended, uh, paid all our debt down on that district and it's ready to be closed. So under state statute, we, the council has to accept a resolution to uh, terminate the TIF district and then pay out um, the funds that are left in the fund balance to the taxing jurisdiction. So I've gotten a couple calls from a few of you over what the numbers look like. So there's a roughly a fund balance of about 2.6 million in this fund. Um, the city's portion of the tax bill is about 38%. So we should see around 980,000. The school districts is about 36%, so they should get around 936,000. Uh, Sheboygan County is about 22% of the tax bill, so they should get around 572, 572,000. And then Lakeshore Technical College is about 3%. Um, they would get about 80,000, and then there's some remainder 1% that goes to the state. So that would be how the payout would roughly look. Uh, the city's in for around 980,000 payout of this district, and 
Um, those numbers will be finalized once CLA completes the audit on the district and then authorizes Marty to release the checks and close the district. The timeliness of this is the uh, document needs to be approved by April 15th in order to comply with state uh, Department of Revenue regulations. So if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions for Chad? Mary Lynn? Um, yeah. Uh, I just would like to ask Chad, so Chad, the, these funds that come in, where can we put them or do they just go to the general fund? Well, we're moving into a budget deficit, so maybe this will fill a year or two of that <laughs> for the 500000 that's missing from the power plant. So, Well, I was wondering if we would actually use it. Uh, don't we have some, some issues with South Point? Being a, a I mean, we, deficit. yeah, I, I, I don't us. know. I mean, that's going to be, have to be discussed where that money ultimately goes and what we use yeah. it for. But we don't have to necessarily use it for another, it's not subject to being used in another TIF district. Okay, thank you. It can be used for general obligation or operational. Don't tell Daryl. He's already calculated it. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Motion to recommend. Well, sounds like uh, good news. Um, so, and I think I heard a motion to recommend uh, the termination of the district and uh, distribution of the excess increment. Is that, was that you, Todd? Yes, it was. Okay. I'll second it. Second? All right. I'm seconded by Jim. Any other questions or discussions? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Chair votes aye. Very good. Thank you. Um, 3.7 is a resolution establishing an early retirement incentive program and authorizing the city administrator and the acting director of human resources to offer benefits to qualifying city employees. Who would like to take this for us? This is Marty. I will uh, take, take this uh, topic. Um, so the... Uh, Policy that is in place uh, for this uh, agenda item is a result of the Clifton Larson Allen assessment and some of the early uh, identified areas of that assessment uh, coincide with finding the uh, appropriate staffing levels, staffing individuals, uh, both on engagement, uh, skill set, and as a result, uh, discussions uh, took place certainly with staff in, in giving the early uh, feedback from this assessment. And at times, sometimes a individual is not necessarily in exact alignment with what the assessment reveals. And a policy was established to um, offer a early in uh, early retirement incentive that would be um, only uh, for the non-exempt employees within the finance and HR department at this time. Uh, as a result, it affects really only two individuals as eligible, and um, at this point, that's uh, where we're at as far as the policy being the first step. Um, certainly, I can answer questions, but uh, not looking to get into specific names at this point. Any questions for Marty? Uh, this is Jim. I have a, just a general question with not getting into any, any specific people. Uh, and, and this might be uh, something our, our interim HR director could get involved in. Uh, with, the, with the current situation with unemployment, uh, the maximum benefit I understand for the, for, for Wisconsin is three hundred three hundred is three hundred and seventy dollars a week, and uh, with this latest thing that the federal government has passed, that's an additional six hundred dollars. So theoretically, a person that's collecting unemployment could get nine hundred and seventy dollars a week. My question is, I don't know how long uh, unemployment lasts in Wisconsin. I haven't had any recent experience with it. Uh, and then the federal program, I believe, was going to go out two or three months. I guess my question would be, would it be a better deal for these employees to consider going on unemployment and collecting the state amount along with the, 
with the uh, federal amount and come out better than anything we would offer them on the way out the door. Certainly, Jim, that's a... That's a Chuck, Chuck Adams oh. here. Go ahead, Chuck. Okay. Um, so, uh, it, uh, so the unemployment wouldn't work exactly that way. Uh, the, the issue would be is that typically in, in, in unemployment, you, you, you know, you're releasing someone uh, and, uh, you know, either, uh, either for cause or uh, because you don't have uh, the work for them. Uh, this program really deals with a, uh, a different circumstance. There's not necessarily, some, uh, you know, some sort of disciplinary cause to, to release somebody. And, and it's not necessarily that we don't have work for them. Rather, it's, it's really in response to the CLA program. So uh, realistically, uh, I'm not, I, I don't believe that unemployment would be an option on, under this uh, particular situation. Are you talking about the federal or the state or both? A combination of, of either one. Okay, thank you. And then I guess also, Chuck, uh, as long as you're there, uh, if, if, we, uh, uh, if we just summarily uh, let somebody go and they decided to sue us, uh, what kind of uh, what kind of dollars would we be looking at, and then potentially if the if the ex employee was successful, would that include us paying their legal fees also? Well, if you summarily let someone go, um, you know, it, obviously it depends on the individual circumstance, and you know, we're not. Uh, this program isn't really designed. Um, you know, it, it's not aimed at one employee or anything of the sort, e even though there's likely a limited number of people who would likely choose to take this. Um, so it, it's going to really depend on the individual circumstances. What I can say is that um, a, if you summarily uh, terminate someone and you don't have the proper basis for doing it and you've done it for the improper reasons, yeah, potentially you can have um, you know, significant costs, uh, including paying, uh, you know, what paying salaries that would have expected to have been paid, uh, including paying the costs that the uh, employee would incur in, uh, uh, in filing that lawsuit. Uh, and then one more thing, Chuck, and that is, as uh, I would presume that these people, these people that we would offer this to would be at will employees. Uh, what, how does this fit in with an at-will employee being, my understanding of an at-will employee, they're serving at, at, our, at our pleasure, and if we decide to let them go, uh, they're an at-will employee. They don't have as much recourse as, as, uh, as an, an, exempt, an exempt employee. Would that be true? So an at-will employee doesn't mean no recourse. It just means that the nature of the recourse is, is very specific. Uh, in, in this case, um, you know, what we're, we're trying to do is uh, recognize the fact that we have valuable employees that, that have done uh, service over the years, uh, that, that things do sometimes change. Uh, the CLA report uh, reflects some things that need to change. And we're trying to find uh, a good way to sort of uh, align the fact that we have valuable employees who provided good service in the past uh, with the fact that there have been some changes and there's probably a need uh, to uh, align the departments in a somewhat different way. That's, that's very different than a circumstance where we just simply have decided that uh, an, an employee is, you know, uh, you know not someone that we want to have with us anymore at all. And, uh, you know, you terminate them. This, this, this is not, this is a little bit of a different circumstance than, than that. Uh, thank you. Are there uh, any other questions for Chuck? Uh, I'm just going to, I just want to make a comment on this. Uh, initially, I wasn't going to support this, but 
uh, after uh, thinking about it and you know knowing what what the payout potentially would be for an employee and the and possibly the legal repercussions it may be uh, it may be advantageous for the city to offer this in lieu of maybe a lot more expense so on that in that regard I'm going to vote for it but uh, I, I I don't I still don't like the concept of having to uh, pay out large sums of money and I just hope that this doesn't uh, set a precedent for future employees that uh, may be considering retiring and may not be the best employees and are going to demand the same thing so that that's a danger that I see but I will support it because I think in the long run it'd probably be more cost effective for the city thanks Mary Lynn, motion to recommend. Any other questions? All right, we have a motion to, if, if you have your microphone on, if you could mute it, that would be helpful. Um, we have a motion to recommend uh, that uh, we establish an early retirement incentive program. Uh, is there a second? Uh, second, Mitchell. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? I just want to uh, give my thanks to Chuck for your uh, excellent answers. Much appreciated. Um, with that in mind, if there are no other uh, comments, uh, all those in favor, uh, please state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes to aye. The motion is passed. Um, we're going to go on to 3.8, which is a claim from Ryan LLC. Um, I'm trying to see what kind of action we want on this. This would be, uh, yeah, this, this, this is a claim. That we're just asking for filing. Uh, this is a this particular one uh, we uh, we did already uh, pay the, the claim. All right. If we could have a motion to accept and file. Motion to recommend and file. Is there a second? Second. Very good. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, state aye. 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 All right. Any nays? Chair votes aye. Motion uh, passes. All right. 3.9 is a claim uh, from Scott Brown, and we are looking for a motion to accept and file. Motion to accept and file. Second. Is there a second? All right. Um, is there any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. 3.10 is a uh, claim from the Sheboygan Area School District. Motion to accept and, and file. Uh, all right. Very good. Very good. And there's a second. I think that's a second, second right? Okay. Um. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any opposed? Chair votes aye, motion passes. Uh, 3.1 is a lot of claims to be referred to, um, to be referred to the Finance and Personnel Committee of the New Common Council. Motion to recommend to move to the New Council. Second. Is there a second? All right. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion passes. 3.12 are a variety of summons and complaints to be uh, accepted and filed. Is there such a motion? So, so moved. Second. 
All right. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 And uh, any opposed? Chair votes aye. And 3.13 is a motion to move to the next council. Well, you're not even letting second. me finish. Jeez. Second. <laughs> so we have a motion in the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion passes. All right. So. Um, we move on to 4.1, which is a summary of the community survey. Daryl, is that yours? Yes, it is. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will keep my, my comments uh, relatively brief. Uh, I will be making a presentation to the Common Council tonight uh, in, in uh, substantially more detail. Uh, but I did want to share with you which uh, I feel are really incredible uh, positive trends uh, over the five years that the city has been uh, creating and sending out to our residents uh, a community survey. Uh, you'll note on the IFC, uh, it's identified that uh, 1,455 uh, uh, responses were received, which is equivalent to a little over 3% of the city's uh, residents who are 18 years uh, of age or older. Uh, when we started um, back in uh, 2016, uh, we've seen an increase of over 200% since that time. Just in one year alone, from 2019 to 2020, uh, we we're 14% higher as far as responses. Um, we do have sort of two um, lengths of surveys. Uh, last year, in conjunction with ARP, uh, we put together a very comprehensive survey uh, and some of that information received was incorporated into this Sheboygan Livability Plan. Uh, this year was a shorter survey. Uh, we hope to work with the city's uh, communication task force uh, for the 2021 community survey uh, to make sure that uh, the questions more closely are tailored toward meeting uh, the needs of our strategic plan. Um, so we look forward to working uh, on the survey questions, as I mentioned, and possibly changing some things up. The good news is that since 2016 to 2020, uh, several of the questions remain the same. And as a result, we're able to uh, receive uh, some great sort of trend analysis. Um, some of the things I'd like to go over um, and highlight are uh, the key question that we've asked you every year is uh, the overall quality of life in the city of Sheboygan. Uh, those that uh, check the box excellent or good, we, uh, 80 percent of the overall respondents uh, check those boxes. Since 2016, uh, that 80 percent uh, uh, has increased uh, 18 percent. Uh, so again, it's really a bright, uh, sort of a bright note to the overall uh, feelings that uh, city residents have. We also asked sort of a similar question, uh, asking participants uh, the general direction that the city is heading. 79% indicated uh, improving or steady. Uh, this is consistent with uh, last year's survey, but a 36% increase uh, over the five-year period. So again, a significant sort of feeling amongst our residents that things are changing and things are changing uh, in a positive way. Uh, the next sort of set of questions are city performance related. Uh, for overall performance, uh, excellent or good, 81% uh, felt that way, almost a 20% increase since 2016. Uh, one of our next item was one of our strategic plans focus area is communication. So we asked the question, uh, in keeping residents informed, how well are we doing? Uh, excellent or good rating, 71% felt that, that way. Uh, that reflects a 23% gain uh, from our initial 2016 survey. So over the five years that we've had the community strategic plan, again, this is something we've worked hard on. Uh, we've changed things up internally. Uh, we have a new communication specialist. So all this has contributed to uh, an increase and uh, residents are responding. Uh, the largest upturn 
uh, experience since the 2016 survey is to the question of delivering services efficiently. The results indicate 63% of respondents checked excellent or good. That's a 32% increase, 32% increase over a five-year period. For the top five rated city services or functions, uh, those that responded very important or important, uh, the top five are fire service, drinking water, emergency medical services, police services, and public access to Lake Michigan. These are all 80% or higher as being very important or important. Of those top five that I mentioned, uh, I think four, three or four of them have been consistently in uh, the different surveys over the years. Uh, last year, one uh, that was part of the top five that was not in the top five this year is, uh, as far as being in very important or important, is attracting and keeping businesses. So hopefully, maybe that's a reflection that we have been successful so the residents are not uh, uh, coding that uh, or responding to that as, as being very important or important. Survey participants indicated positive gains as well in the, to the question of how well the city is doing in each, in each of our areas. Uh, for the rating of excellent or good, uh, this is really interesting over the, over the five-year period. Uh, zoning and land use actually had the largest increase in improvement 37% uh, increase in those checking excellent or good. Support for neighborhoods, 37% uh, uh, increase. Street tree, street tree maintenance, a 36% rise in checking excellent or good. Public transit services, 23% increase. And overall city administration, a 22% uh, increase. Um, in 2019, uh, the areas that received the highest excellent or good were EMS, um, fire, police, uh, and leaf pickup. For excellent and good rated city departments, the top five were fire department, me public library, police department, city clerk's office, and the senior activity center were tied for fourth and fifth place. Um, the fire department continues to just excel in their positive response uh, by residents. Last year, it was also in the top five uh, with 93%. So again, being number one in 2019 at 93%, uh, being excellent or good, but they even exceeded uh, sort of expectations in that they're now at 97%. So that's an incredible uh, support that this department has throughout the community. Over the past five years, those departments that received an excellent or good um, uh, increase uh, the largest increase as far as over that six year period of time was actually the city administrator's office. The next was common council, finance department, shoreline metro, the mayor's office, municipal court, planning and development, uh, property assessing, city attorney, and building inspection. All those I mentioned had at least an 8% or more increase. The top end of the range was as high as a 35% increase in a rating of excellent or good compared to when we started these surveys back in 2016. I mentioned earlier about top communication, or, or communication being important. So we also asked the residents, where do you receive uh, information, or where do you search for information about the city of Sheboygan? Uh, the city's website uh, was number one. Sheboygan Press was number two. She uh, Sheboygan Sun uh, was number three. WHBL was four. And next door was number five. Uh, this is the first time that next door has appeared as one of the top five sources of revenue or, or information about the city's operations. Uh, last year, um, next, uh, as I mentioned, next door, this is the first year it's appeared on our top five list. Last year, the fifth uh, spot was held by the city's Facebook account. Uh, for four most critical uh, projects or potential new initiatives, we asked an open-ended question, and the top four subject matters, uh, no surprise, the number one was street or street repair-related questions or comments. Affordable housing-related uh, comments was number two, most frequently uh, identified. Neighborhood revitalization. And the last was uh, business development, uh, including comments about downtown, the mix of businesses in our community. Um, we actually had a few Olive Garden uh, comments that were mentioned, no. which is always humorous for all of us. 
Um, Chad Pelishek says it's something that they teach as part of the curriculum at this public school district. Uh, all in all, uh, the typical uh, resident uh, checked the box that they were between the age of 56 and 65. Uh, as far as uh, race, 97% uh, white, uh, as far as participants in the survey. And uh, for the category of how long have you resided within the city of Sheboygan, 50% uh, or more uh, checked the box that they had been residents for 25 years or more. As I mentioned, I'm going to be going into a slightly more detail at the Common Council meeting tonight. Uh, is there any questions of me uh, at the Finance and Personnel Committee level? Great job. Um, and I think we'll hold questions at Errol until the council meeting gives people a little bit of time to uh, stretch their legs before uh, the meeting starts, uh, which will be soon. Um, unless there's a burning question. Good. Mo nice to have this information. Motion to adjourn. meeting will be determined. And I would ask for a motion to adjourn sine die. Motion to adjourn. Senate Day. All right. Is there a second? Second. I take All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Is Domogolski going to show up? I, I don't need to sit here. I can sit where you're sitting. 